Hello everyone and welcome back to Neuroscience Methods 101. Today we are going to talk about magnetic resonance imaging, abbreviated as MRI. If you have ever been to a hospital or if you have ever seen a medical drama, you will probably have seen one of these tube-like machines. This is an MRI scanner. First developed around 50 years ago, the MRI scanner has become one of neuroscience's most valuable tools, as it allows us to make a snapshot of someone's brain. Now, you can do a lot of things with an MRI scanner, such as measuring brain activity or look where all nerve fibers are going, but the most common use is to make a structural MRI scan. So let's take a look how that works. Alright, so this is a brain, and the brain consists of a lot of water and a water molecule is known as H2O. And the H stands for hydrogen. And hydrogen is kind of special, since it has only a single proton and no neutrons. The protons spin around their own axis, which is called nuclear spin. And you could basically compare it to a tabletop spinner. But of course, you have to remember that in the brain there are many, many hydrogen protons, and they're all oriented in a different direction and spin at different phases. Interestingly, in a large magnetic field, such as in an MRI scanner, all protons start to line up. Most protons line up in the same direction as the magnetic field, in other words, in a parallel direction, but some others line up in the opposite direction of the magnetic field, in the so-called anti-parallel direction. Also, protons don't stand still, but they wobble around from side to side, comparable to an actual tabletop spinner. So, Let's organize all the protons that spin in parallel and anti-parallel direction. If we average everything out, there will be a so-called net magnetization in the parallel direction. So the net magnetization would give us an indication of the amount of hydrogen protons in a specific area. The problem is you cannot measure this net magnetization directly. As an analogy, imagine a box on the floor. You don't really know how heavy it is until you pick it up. So similarly, in order to measure the net magnetization, we need to apply a trick. First we have to change the net magnetization and then let it recover to its original value. And this change we can measure. That is why, when doing an MRI scan, a radio frequency pulse is applied. Although it's called radio frequency, we're of course not talking about a real radio. The frequencies used by the MRI radio frequency pulse are about 10 to 100 times faster than those in an actual radio. When the radio frequency pulse is applied, two things happen at the same time. One thing is that the radio frequency pulse causes more protons to turn upside down in the anti-parallel direction. This causes the net magnetization in that direction to turn to zero. After the radio frequency pulse is turned off, the protons return back to their original parallel position, meaning that the net magnetization returns. The process of protons going back to their original position is referred to as relaxation. And in this particular example, the relaxation happens in the same direction as the magnetic field, in the so-called longitudinal direction. And therefore, we call this process longitudinal relaxation. And it is typically abbreviated as T1. Now, there is also a second process caused by the radio frequency pulse. And that is that all protons start to spin in synchrony. So at one specific point in time, all protons point towards the same direction. This means that there is a magnetization in the transverse direction of the main magnetic field. After the radio frequency pulse is turned off, the spinning synchrony is lost, meaning that the net transverse magnetization returns to zero. And this process is called transverse relaxation and is abbreviated as T2. Now both relaxations, T1 and T2, give us images of the brain but they have different properties. Also, because the process of transverse and longitudinal relaxation happens at different speeds, we need to adjust radio frequency parameters to either give us a T1 weighted image or a T2 weighted image. In a T1 weighted image, for example, areas with a higher water content, such as the cerebrospinal fluid, appear to be dark. Whereas in a T2 weighted image, the same areas appear as white. Now either T1 or T2 weighted images can be valuable for different purposes, such as investigating different neurological disorders. Also, T1 and T2 weighted images are just two of the many scans that can be done, and there are a lot more parameters that can be tweaked to get different kinds of structural MRI images. Anyway, that's it. 
We hope you enjoyed this explanation about structural MRI. If you did, consider giving this video a like. And as always, we hope to see you the next time.